Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, midweek uh, Lenten devotion number two. And again, we will, with God's help, uh, see what Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, saw in the passion of our Savior Jesus. You have your two-part uh, handout uh, again for today. The, uh, the readings for the Passion History, the, the large part of the handout, and then the listing uh, of the hymns and, um, and the verses from Isaiah uh, on the other handout. If you weren't here uh, last Wednesday out here at Emmanuel, uh, we are using for our order of service the <coughs> service of the devotional uh, part of our hymnal, the close of day or compline, uh, that's on page 246 and 247. Uh, of the hymnal, and uh, it's the same service they're using at St. John's, only uh, theirs is with all the musical accompaniment. Uh, here, uh, all the responses uh, are spoken. We will insert the hymns, and uh, also today we have the children of the school uh, to sing uh, as well. So let's begin. Uh, turn with me to page 246, and we read those words responsibly. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To sing praise to your name, O Most High. To herald your love in the morning. Your truth at the close of day. We sing together our opening hymn number 400, uh, sweet the moments, rich in blessing. <laughs> Peace. 
by the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated. At this time, the children will sing uh, the King of Glory. Although that glory is hidden behind the cross, he still is the King of Glory. uncertain which of them he meant. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining at Jesus' side. Simon Peter motioned to him to find out which one Jesus was talking about. So, leaning back against Jesus' side, he asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus replied, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread after I have dipped it in the dish. Then he dipped the piece of bread and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told them, what you are about to do, do more quickly. 
None of those reclining at the table understood why Jesus said this to him. Because Judas kept the money box, some thought that Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. After Judas left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. While they were eating on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, blessed and broken, and gave it to his disciples. He said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Dear children, I am going to be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, so also you are to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, Where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus replied, Will you really lay down your life for me? Simon, Simon, pay attention. Satan has asked to have you all so that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brothers. Peter answered him, Even if all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Amen, I tell you, tonight before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the disciples said the same. He said to them, When I sent you out without money bag, traveler's bag, and sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they said. Then he told them, But now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a traveler's bag. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. He was counted with transgressors. Indeed, what is written about me is going to have its fulfillment. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. He said to them, that is enough. Then Jesus said to them, this night, you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. After they sang a hymn, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives, where there was a garden called Gethsemane. He and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who was betraying him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. When he reached the place, Jesus told his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Keep praying that you may not enter into temptation. Then he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and began to be troubled and distressed. 
He said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, even to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. When he rose from prayer, he went to the disciples and found them sleeping as a result of sorrow. He said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Were you not strong enough to keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to pass from me unless I drink it, may your will be done. Again he returned and found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what they should answer him. He left them again, went away and prayed a third time. He said the same words as before. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. As he was in agony, he prayed more fervently. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Look, my betrayer is near. <coughs> Here ends the second portion of the Passion History. Our second hymn uh, for today, hymn 396, Christ the Life of All the Living, and today we will sing just the odd-numbered verses. <laughs>
Lord, that suffering servant of the Lord. To him we give our worship again today. Amen. Isaiah chapter 53. You have it printed out there for you. 53 verses 1, 2, and 3. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root from dry ground. He had no attractiveness and no majesty. When we saw him, nothing about his appearance made us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man who knew grief, who was well acquainted with suffering. Like someone whom people cannot bear to look at, he was despised, and we thought nothing of him. So far the words of God's prophet. Who has believed our report? Good question. Good question. Isaiah saw the humiliation and the exaltation of Jesus. That was last Wednesday. Though he was by very nature God, he did not consider equality with God a prize to be displayed. But he emptied himself, took on the form of a servant, became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There you have it. There's his plan. Who has believed our report? The question is rhetorical. It answers itself. Who can believe this? Or really, it's saying nobody will believe this. Some 700 years later, the Apostle Paul quoted this verse from Isaiah and used it to explain to us that not all the Israelites accepted the good news. St. John used this very same verse from Isaiah when he was talking about Jesus. Even after all of the miraculous signs, he said, they still would not believe. Rejection dogged the, the ministry of all the apostles and, and all the saints. Nay, hey, our, our own sincere, urgent, and, and, and fervent pleading with those we know and that we love, even all of the most clear and eloquent teaching and preaching falls on deaf ears. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Or in other words, who really gets it? Who really gets it that this is the way that God is going to reveal his strength to save souls for eternity through the promised Savior who is a suffering servant, 
Isaiah is revealing for us here by the Holy Spirit's guidance a, a beautiful message that no one will believe. We're doing Lent with the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Let's see what Isaiah was led by the Holy Spirit to see this week. Isaiah sees a man of sorrows. Isaiah sees Christ's sorrow. The prophecy of Isaiah is 66 chapters long. <laughs> oh, it's filled with some really good stuff. Good stuff about God, about us, about us and God. Good stuff about what it's all about and what it will be. These verses are, are part of a, of a larger section called the Servant Songs. And this one is the Song of the Suffering Servant. Now, it, it helps to understand that all what Isaiah was saying and doing here took place during a time of some glaring unfaithfulness and some gross unbelief on the part of God's people. And now God was going to discipline them <clears throat> for their sin. <laughs> there are some really dark passages of judgment in those 66 chapters. But there are also lots of wonderful moments there too of, of hope. The one we call the bad news. The other we call the gospel. The good news. Good news which specifically reveals to us our redemption from sin and all of its ugly, ugly consequences. That's what the suffering servant of the Lord is all about. But this, who can believe this? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root from dry ground. A tender shoot is weak and vulnerable. It hasn't developed that, that thick bark yet to protect it. And, and dry ground is usually a pretty hostile environment for any plant. He had no attractiveness and no majesty. When we saw him, nothing about his appearance made us desire him. I mean, who can, can look at what Isaiah saw here and not sarcastically conclude, whoa, yeah, there's son of God, king material. Not. Remember, many of Israel's kings were, well, they really looked the part. Handsome, striking figures. We think of King Saul, a head taller than, than everybody else and, and good looking. David, the great King David, he had everything. He was a, a real man's man. But Isaiah here takes all of that and, and turns it upside down. You know how kids, especially when they're little, can say some embarrassing things, you know, before they develop those filters, before they talk. Like, Mommy, why is that man so ugly? <laughs> hey, when the suffering servant of the Lord comes, when he does his work, it gets ugly. He was despised and rejected by men. A man who knew grief, who was well acquainted with suffering. He was rejected by men. Literally, that says, he lacked men. He was alone. He was alone. 
And when the chips were really down, even his own disciples left him in the lurch. Alone. Really. How much more unbelievable can you make this, Isaiah? Are you sure? Are you sure that this is what you saw? This suffering servant? A man who knew grief. A man of sorrows. That's what Isaiah sees. Christ's sorrows. That's what he sees. But that can be so hard to believe, right? The Son of God. Jesus, our Jesus. You expect it to see joy. You expect to see beauty. After all, this is God's Son, begotten of the Father from all eternity. The psalm writer David in Psalm 16 saw fullness of joy in your presence, pleasures at your right hand forever. That great hymn that we sing, The Church's One Foundation, says, From heaven he came and bought us to be his holy bride. And in Revelation, St. John was able to see what? He was able to see that there will be no more death, no more sorrow or crying or pain. A man of, of sorrow? For you expect to see joy and beauty? He was holy. He was untouched by sin and all the ravages that, that sin can bring. He was born in the purity of, of the virgin and, and we're told that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Sounds like he was pleasant to see and pleasant to know. But really, though, what did he look like? A guy by the name of Abgar of Edessa lived at the same time of Jesus. And it's said that he even exchanged letters with Jesus. And also, they said, he acquired a portrait of Jesus. So he knew what he looked like. Then there was a gal named Veronica who supposedly offered her veil to the Lord Jesus as he was carrying his cross down that road of sorrows to Calvary's cross. But when it was returned to her, the face of Jesus was imprinted on that veil. About 10 years ago, they say, at a, a pizza parlor in Brisbane, Australia, a three cheese pizza miraculously came out of the oven with the face of Jesus embedded in the cheese. Now, one might question that, but isn't the real question, how did they know that that was Jesus? There are no biblical descriptions of what he looked like. We try to, to picture him and people have for generations. But really, no picture of Jesus is, is really a picture of Jesus. And the ones we do have, right, they usually try to show him as being handsome and, and heroic, if not warm and inviting. But in a world of sin, and in a world of sinners, Isaiah sees Christ's sorrow. Folks, it's not easy to believe, to, to act like it, to think like it, and to talk.
walk like it. It's not easy to, to keep on believing. It's just not natural. It takes a supernatural act of God's grace. It requires the gift of God, faith, worked in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, using the Spirit's tools, the Word, and the sacraments. The real, true picture of Jesus is found in the Word and in the sacraments. That's God's media. And that's where you will see what Isaiah saw. We have, we have baptism. Water. Huh? Simple water. And, and some words. We have Holy Communion. A thin, bland wafer and a thimble full of, of common wine. We have the Word. Just words. But what do all three of those things have in common? Jesus. Jesus gave us the sacraments. Jesus is the Word. In all three of those things, they get their power and they get their meaning, and they get their, their beauty from the cross. From the suffering servant. Take away the cross. <laughs> you don't have baptism. You got water. Without the cross, you don't have body and blood, just bread and wine. Without the cross, You don't really have God's Word, but rather a, a bunch of stories that you can take them or leave them. Nothing more. But with the cross, with the cross comes the power. With the cross comes the meaning. With the cross comes the beauty. Visibly hidden in plain sight behind Christ's sorrow. God's glory, the believer's joy, our believing, that's not generated by, by our feelings. It's not all conjured up by us going through the church motions or even doing Lent. It's all found in the man of sorrow and wrapped up beautifully in baptism, the Lord's Supper, and in the Word. And even though we still sin, and let's be honest, we do, even though we can often be so lukewarm about him and his message, even though we still find ourselves so often chasing after the world's visible, tangible joy and glory, you can still ponder the cross. You can still rejoice over the open tomb. You can still have that, that joy of your salvation through this man of sorrows. You can stand in his very presence. You can have a relationship with him. You have access to him anytime, anywhere, and about anything. As we do Lent with, with the prophet Isaiah, we can see what he saw, visibly hidden on full display in Christ's sorrow. Who will believe our report? 
Ask. Ask. Ask God for the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit that allows you to believe it. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? To you. To me. To all. Let me finish with this today. On Monday, I did some pastor Monday morning quarterbacking. I, I read a devotion based on one of the readings that we had last Sunday on the, that verse from Hebrews, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. And, and that, that devotion said this, among other things, at times... That is what we need most. Assurance that our faith is not in vain. That we're not wasting our time. Or being played for fools with, with all this Christianity stuff. We have all had seasons of going through some pretty heavy stuff in life. Both self-inflicted and because of others. It's in the heart of those moments when our old Adam seems to find fresh confidence to raise doubts and question if God is really there. Or if our faith in him is foolishness. Let your faith cling even tighter to the promises of God and the words of Scripture. God never promised that our road would be without potholes. But he did promise us that staying the course in faith and navigating those potholes would find the greatest reward when we reach the destination. So stay the course and stay buckled in with the seatbelt of faith. Believe the unbelievable. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please turn uh, again to uh, our order of service, page 247, and I invite you again as you're able to stand uh, for prayer and blessing. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry. Keep me as the apple of your eye. In righteousness I shall see you. When I awake, your presence will give me joy. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the silent hours of this coming night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this fleeting world may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we also pray, dear suffering servant, great Redeemer Jesus, you are strong to save. You came to earth to take our place under the law, to suffer and to die that we might live. In the quiet of this place and in the calmness of this moment, make ours a, a faithful walk to Calvary. As the weeks pass and the record of your love unfolds, may we ponder what this central story of the Christian truth means for us. In the upper room, the garden, the high priest's court, Pilate's palace, the road of sorrows, Golgotha. Was there ever anything more melancholy? And yet, 
What glory, what promise, and what triumph. And it's all for us. What language is there to express our thanks to you, dear Savior and Lord? Amen. And together we pray the prayer he has taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And together those words of the Song of Simeon. In peace, Lord, you let your servant now depart according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for every people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Almighty and Merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our closing hymn, 784, Now the Light Has Gone Away. <laughs>
uh, you bring to people uh, when you sing uh, for our hearts and for our walk uh, in faith as well. Thank you. I guess there's a supper tonight if you want to go to St. John's. I think it's uh, steak. <laughs> That'll get you there, right? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure it'll be good, whatever it may be. I'll see you next week. Thanks for worshiping.